to the graphic nature of this program, viewer discretion is advised. I'm Gordon Coulter. For many years I served as a law enforcement officer. Today it's my privilege to host this program on a little known area in law enforcement but important to every small community and every large city across our vast country. It's the area of satanic cults and how they impact our families, our children, and our communities. In satanic occultism, that which is good is bad, and that which is bad is good. And as you view this learning and educational tape, pay attention to notice the reverse of everything that is normal becoming abnormal. There are many crimes that are unsolved in our cities, and many of those crimes have ritualistic overtones, but they're hard to find, and it's difficult to find the, the depth of where these things go and who may have done them. And so today we hope to be able to shed some light on a dark, dark area, an area that has been taboo for so many years, that is also protected by the United States Constitution and the freedom of religion. That's why it's very difficult for us as law enforcement officers to really investigate. But the question really is, where do the freedoms end and our responsibilities begin for our communities? <laughs> Satanic cults and their various offshoots exist throughout the world. However, a difficulty immediately arises with the word cult. Many cults fall under the protection of the United States Constitution, the freedom of religion. When we talk of cults and Satanism from a law enforcement perspective, we have to tread lightly. That is one of the reasons it is so difficult to investigate Satanic cult activities. We know what the Satanic cult professes to believe know what their potential for violence might be if they choose to be true to their belief. We even have evidence, here and there, that leads us to believe that some sort of rituals are taking place. However, unless we catch them actually breaking the law, or find evidence that leads directly to participants in some illegal activity, we have no case. The problem involved with the cult explosion is becoming a many-faceted puzzle confronting law enforcement today. Not only is it difficult for us to understand the secret practices of satanic worship, but there are deeper reasons that go beyond mere lust for power and the unlimited drugs and deviant sexual behavior that go with it. Unfortunately, the police investigator attempts to analyze these types of crimes with his routine of criminal investigation. In the cases of satanic practices involving deviant sexual behavior, the investigator forgets the offense was committed by an abnormal person influenced by many strange and complex motivations. And therefore, law enforcement's analysis of the crime and the criminal must be guided by the principles of abnormal sexology. It is imperative that these cases be solved. They are vicious, revolting, and create fear in any community. Men are apprehensive for the safety of their wives, mothers, and daughters, women for their children and themselves. It is only through proper training that the police officer can hope to gain the ability to understand and recognize which are regular offenses and those that belong to cult behaviors. This is a law enforcement problem. Therefore, all law enforcement officers should be familiar with the different types of degeneracy, so they'll be able to associate the type of criminal with the offense committed, and to properly charge and prosecute the criminal in an intelligent manner.
There are three general areas and levels of involvement in satanic occult worship. The first would be dabblers. They're people who just use it for fun and games, may be involved in some video games and that kind of level, possibly a little graffiti, but reasonably innocent. The second level would be those that are involved for spiritual reasons, and they recognize that there's power in the worship of Satan. These people generally worship together and try to find the mystery of it all. And then the third level would be criminal involvement, and that's the area that interests us. These people actually believe that they gain power through criminal activity, through killing people, through various rituals that are against the law in our states and in our country. Eric Pryor is a former satanic high priest turned Christian who now spends his time educating people about the dark side of satanic cults. When I was a practicing occultist, it, oftentimes I would come into this park and uh, practice on various different holidays, uh, lunar holidays and occultic holidays, and we'd actually have rituals in the park when we didn't have a space to do rituals indoor. Uh, so what I'd like to do is take you into the park and just kind of show you one of the places that you would start asking your questions and start looking to see you know, what the occultists are up to. There's two different communities that use this park. Uh, one is the uh, pagan or occultic community, and the other community is, of course, the homosexual community. Interestingly enough, uh, they go hand in hand. And so, well, see, here you go. Uh, upon entering the park, I mean, you can see they've already got started. Uh, okay. Uh, this is a pentacle. The interesting thing about this pentacle is it's an upright pentacle. This is not a satanic pentacle. Now, the reason why this pentacle would not be considered satanic is because it has one point up. Now, Satanists would reverse this star, or pentacle as it's called, and have two points up. Those represent uh, the horns of Baphomet uh, and or the horns of Satan. Uh, but now, right over here, I can see on a tree here, there's a, there's a uh, inverted cross. Now this is satanic. This is a very generic symbol. Um, let me see. It's, well, it's actually fairly fresh, too. Um, this here, of course, is a, a bastardization of Christianity, and it's a very common symbol. Obviously, they probably had a party or, or a ritual here uh, within the past night or two. Uh, usually what they'll do is they'll mark, it's almost like a path, they'll mark a path to kind of show you where the action's at. Uh, the colors they'll use will be white, red, and black. Those are the dominant uh, colors of uh, the satanic movement. And uh, basically, well, okay, over here, see? Here you go. This, well, see, this is, this is what I'm talking about. Okay, uh, what you're looking at here is called Voodoo Vivi. Um, this is kind of like a coat of arms, if you will, uh, for the demonic. And uh, the implications of this is definitely satanic. Uh, when I showed you earlier the one pointed up star as we first came in, and I told you that you know the implications of Satanism are two points up, as you can see, there are two points up here. And someone has made it very clear uh, they were probably worshiping Set, because it, it says Set here, so it's pretty obvious. Now, this here, if I'm not mistaken, uh, looks like a money VV. So, I wouldn't be surprised if they were here in the park doing a money ritual. And uh, this is very typical. This is the kind of thing that you can expect to see, uh, not only on crime scenes, but in areas where occultists hang out. Um, like gang graffiti, occultists kind of communicate to each other through their graffiti. On the rise there up here is, is a very flat area, concrete area, uh, that is used often, I even frequented it, uh, for ritual practice. Well, there you go. You can see from here um, 666 and an I. Now that I above 666 is an Egyptian I. Uh, the Eye of Anubis, 
So I can tell by looking at this eye that these people that were up here were into ceremonial magic. Um, these aren't witches. These are definitely Satanists. You look at these dumpsters. See, this is how they talk to each other. Now, what you see here, this is gang graffiti, okay? And this, this is how gangs talk to each other, okay? But now this is how occultists talk to each other. This here is a psilocybin mushroom. So probably um, they had a, a psilocybin ritual, which is not uncommon. Occultists are known for using uh, uh, peyote and, and psilocybin. And uh, so this was probably uh, a, a psilocybin ritual. Okay, here you go. Shem Hemfarash is a satanic invocation, and Halley is also part of a satanic invocation. There is a book out called The Greater Key of Solomon. And in The Greater Key of Solomon, you will see on the seal of Solomon this word. All right, from what I can tell um, from the graffiti and everything that I've seen, and what I see here on the uh, concrete, it looks like they actually have the ritual here. Now, there's an N here for north, and there's an S over here for south. Now, while these are not the true directions, obviously someone had a bad sense of direction, I'm assuming that this is where they actually had their ritual. One of the reasons why they would use this particular area to have a ritual is it is on concrete, and it's a nice open area. When we used to come up and uh, have rituals, and we had a group, we would look for an open flat space. This is an open flat space. This would be an ideal place for them to have a ritual. Um, now, if I was a solo occult practitioner, I might do it in, in the bushes somewhere and have a little altar set up. So what you're doing is when you come onto a scene and you're investigating a scene, you look on the ground and you'll find clues as to what happened. Uh, right here, okay, we have a rope here. Uh, this, is a, this is a noose. And actually, if you look at it closely, I don't know if the camera can pick this up, but there's blood on this noose. Now, this could have been used either to uh, bind someone up in some type of a ritual scourging, or it could have actually been used on an animal uh, that was sacrificed. Uh, when sacrificing a cat or a dog, of course, animals move around a lot and they get unruly, so they would tie it up. But there is blood all over this particular noose. Now, these are the kind of things that you'd be looking for. What we have here is a medicine bottle of 2% xylocaine. For those of you with medical knowledge, you would know uh, xylocaine, known as lidocaine, um, is a numbent. It's, it's used to numb uh, people, and for that matter, animals. And of course, if you're going to ritually sacrifice an animal or a human, for that matter, in a public place, you don't want them to be screaming in pain. Um, so it's not uncommon for occultists to use something like this. And of course, here we have it. On this tree here, we have some more graffiti. It's in red, which is a classical um, satanic color. Now what's interesting here is the number nine. Nine represents the nine satanic statements. You can find this in uh, a book by Anton Sanzer LaVey, which is called the Satanic Bible, and you will see that there are nine satanic statements. This is uh, the way occultists tell each other, hey, we're Satanists, and we're partying. The Nine Satanic Statements from the Satanic Bible by Anton LaVey. Number one, Satan represents indulgence instead of abstinence. Number two, Satan represents vital existence instead of spiritual pipe dreams. Number three, Satan represents undefiled wisdom instead of hypocritical self-deceit. Number four, Satan represents kindness to those who deserve it instead of love wasted on ingrates. Number five, Satan represents vengeance instead of turning the other cheek. Number six, Satan represents responsibility to the responsible instead of concern for psychic vampires. Number seven, 
Satan represents man as just another animal, sometimes better, more often worse than those that walk on all fours, who, because of his divine spiritual and intellectual development, has become the most vicious animal of all. Number 8. Satan represents all of the so-called sins as they all lead to physical, mental, or emotional gratification. And number 9. Satan has been the best friend the church has ever had as he has kept it in business all these years. Uh, this is the symbol for the Church of Satan and this is kind of like their crest. Uh, their coat of arms, if you will. This would imply that these people either have affiliations with the Church of Satan or perceive themselves to have affiliations with the Church of Satan. Everything that we've seen here indicates Satanism. Different ritual sites will have different configurations and markings, but this gives you a good example of what to look for. First, upon entering the park, the pentacle and inverted cross were displayed. Second, further up the path, we found a voodoo vivi, which indicated a money ritual. Third, at the open cement areas that are common to satanic activity, we found graffiti that showed recent activity. In addition, we found a bloody noose and a xylocaine vial. Fourth, on the way out of the park, we found another inverted cross and the number nine, which, as we demonstrated, represents the nine satanic statements from the Satanic Bible. Fifth and finally, we found markings indicating that the ritual was by followers of the Church of Satan. Behind me is the city of San Francisco, a city known for the first satanic church in America. Anton LaBay established this church under the freedoms of our country in 1966 and wrote the Satanic Bible. Anton LaVey, perhaps the best known Satanist in America, compiled his years of cult knowledge into two of Satanism's most important handbooks, the Satanic Bible and a companion, the Satanic Rituals. The general practice of Satanism promotes three basic areas of attraction gratification of flesh, gratification of ego, and power. Some Satanists, and a significant number of others, feel that Satanism is a viable way of getting supernatural help because they are too distant from the good God to have any hope of reaching Him. The good God and His virtues, such as beauty and joy, are essentially impractical. And it would be easier to catch the notice of an evil god than a good one. To better understand Satanism, it might be appropriate to talk about some of the initiation practices for Satanists. And to better understand them, you would take a look at what might be traditional Christianity or some normal faith. And if you reversed it, it would be something that Satanists would embrace. Initiation into Satanism or a similar cult usually includes a spoken denial of the Christian faith, generally accompanied by saying the Lord's Prayer backwards. Rebaptism in Satan's name and taking a new name to replace the given Christian name. An oath of allegiance to Satan while standing in a magic circle, entering the initiate's name in the Book of Death. And a promise to sacrifice children to Satan and marking the initiate with the devil's mark. This program is designed to help law enforcement officers better understand satanic cults. Now remember, all satanic people do not commit crimes. Some of their activities are perfectly legal. But there are some things that some satanists do that lead to illegal behavior and some of them seem rather innocent on the surface. Some of those things might be just simple vandalism or trespass. Cruelty to animals that might be detected through mutilations and sacrifice. Kidnapping, whether they're adults or children or even kidnapping of animals. Rape, molestation, 
child abuse, child sexual abuse that may be different than uh, just harming a child, ritual abuse, arson, murder, which might include human sacrifice or mass murders or cannibalism, drug trafficking, sexual trafficking of children, corpse theft, cemetery vandalism, black market sales of bones and skulls, black market baby selling, pedophilia, pornography, torture, uh, desecrating churches or other religious buildings, human slavery, weapons violations, suicides, disposing of animal parts, illegal entry into mortuaries and cemeteries, necrophilia or having sex with dead people. These things may or may not be satanic kinds of rituals, but they're important to note in your reporting because they would fit together in a fabric as follow-up investigations might indicate a deeper need to look into the dark side of your community. So note them well and ask the investigators to do a little further follow-up if you find any of these indicated in a crime or in a police report. There is a difference between Satanism, voodoo, and witchcraft. And what I'd like to do is uh, show you different altar setups so you can familiarize yourself with uh, how these people operate and their various different paraphernalia. These particular groups um, that I'm going to show you the different altar setups of are the type of groups that would most probably be involved in criminal activity. While you wouldn't find all this stuff at a crime scene, you will find evidence that they have been at a crime scene. For instance, you might find something like this pin here, which is used to penetrate a pulpit like we have sitting here. But then again, there are other things that might be left behind that would indicate voodoo. Now, voodoo is colorful, and usually beads and shells are associated with it. What you're looking at here is two small conch shells and some beads. Now this is what a priest would put on the necklace, such as I'm wearing here. This would indicate high priesthood. You might find um, conches like this with beads. You might find powders like this left behind. And this is the type of stuff that would usually be left behind in a crime scene you're not going to find uh, candles intact and if you do you might find a candle very similar to the one I'm holding here now you might look at this candle and say well what makes this candle different well first of all any candle that's used in Santeria Mukumba or Voodoo generally will have a patron saint on the front now this is the saint that they would be paying obeisances to you know lighting the nicotine up to, uh, drinking the rum to, and smoking the cigar smoke to. But on the back, it'll have a prayer to that patron saint that is only indicative to candles used in Santeria, Mokumba, and Voodoo. Another thing that you might find would be small vials like this. These vials will contain some type of a ritual oil. Usually these oils are poured over a coal in a ritual practice. You might find a lot of empty uh, oil vials at a ritual site. What you're looking at here is a classical satanic altar setup. Now there are more than one type of satanic group. There are rogue satanic groups where you have a bunch of young people that get together and they read books such as the Satanic Bible by Anton Sanzer LaVey or some of the stuff that is published by the Temple of Set which is also another large church of Satan. But now an organized satanic group has an organized way of setting up its altar. 
What you're looking at here is a classical satanic altar setup. It's very Spartan. Two candle holders. One candle would have a white, one would have a black. You'd have a Baphomet candle in the center, or a Mendes goat is what it's called. You would have a male candle on the left-hand side and a female candle on the right-hand side. You would have a skull, which is considered the barrier of death, and a bell to ring for each one of the nine satanic statements. And they would ring it. You would also have two ceremonial daggers. One ceremonial dagger is actually used in directing the forces of magic, the way occultists would do that, as in directing their powers. And the other dagger, which would be called a bolain, would actually be used in ritual um, work. If I were going to sacrifice someone, I would use my bolain. It's considered a working knife. So in a satanic altar setup, you're always going to look for two knives. Okay, what you're looking at here is a basic witchcraft setup. Now, the difference is you don't see the bells. You don't see the Satanic Bible. And you'll see a couple extra things here. For instance, most witches are very adept at using the tarot. Witches are very, very big on um, an art called scrying or fortune telling. Another interesting addition is that, notice, the candle holders are wooden. Witches perceive themselves to be nature-centered uh, religious belief systems, so that they use as many natural elements as possible. The other thing is, instead of having a ceremonial dagger like we have here that would be used in Satanism, they would just use a very simple one dagger. That's called an athami. Now, the athami is used when they charge the wine, which would be in the chalice. The athami would be used when they charge the wine, which would be in the chalice. The salt, which would be in the salt bowl. And the water, which would be in the water bowl, as well as the incense. Another interesting addition we have here is Kyrnos. This is one of the gods of the witches. And the center for any witchcraft altarpiece will have either Kyrnos, which is the god of the witches, or Diana. Another thing that witches will often have on their altar is a mortar and pestle because they work a lot with pharmacaea or various different incenses. Now this is an incense we have here that would be used in ritual practice. Notice they're very bright in color. There are many different kinds. These are the kind of things that you might find left over at a crime scene. You might find little piles of colored, it looks like chalk, but it's not chalk. It's actually incense. And if you were to take it and smell it, it usually has a very fragrant smell. Another thing that you'll find is usually there's chalk. There's usually a piece of red chalk and a piece of white chalk. This is used to draw a circle around the ritual area, and it's called a boundary between the worlds. And then what they will do is make various different magical symbols in those circles, believing that these symbols will seal off an area. Now, witches are known for their, their artwork, their, their drawing of symbols, their use of colored powders. Um, and, of course, the use of natural products like wooden candle holders, um, even wooden knives. And so this would be more indicative of witchcraft. As you have seen, the difference between the items you might find on an altar from the various different occult styles is subtle. When you pay attention, you'll see that there is indeed a distinct difference. These differences will give you the understanding of the type of group you're dealing with. 
And when you know the type of group you're dealing with, you'll also learn to understand how they think, where they'll congregate, and where they'll be. There are many different satanic symbols. Here are a few of the more common ones. The inverted cross. This is used to defame the Christian religions. In a righted position, Christ's head would be looking up towards heaven. In this position, it would point downward towards Satan and hell. By defaming a Christian symbol, the thought is that power is taken away. The numbers 666. According to the Bible, these numbers, 666, are the mark of the beast. The pentagram. This inverted star points downward towards hell and Satan. It is a popular symbol, but has no meaning other than a satanic one, and there may be many different versions. The voodoo vivi. As we saw in the park, it represents the type of ritual that occurs. The anarchy, which is the symbol of rebellion and the swastika. In past history, this symbol has been used by witches and warlocks as a magic emblem. A glossary of selected terms. The altar, a table used for satanic rituals, normally a table of flat rock, but can also be a nude physical female being. The Antichrist. The Bible's book of Revelations describes him as the son of Satan who will return and be present to receive his powers and challenge Jesus Christ during his second coming. The Baphomet, described as a deity in the form of a goat-headed god with the wings of angels, the breasts of a female, and carrying a torch between his horns. Black magic, magic that is used for destruction and hate. Black Mass, the most diabolical ritual that can be performed by a Satanist. It entails a blasphemous communion with Satan, desecration of artifacts of Christianity, a mockery of the Holy Bible, and all things that Christians religiously cherish. The ceremonies involve rape and sexual assault, sodomy, animal and human sacrifices, and often the slaughter of unbaptized infants. Blood the life force. Satanists believe that the drinking of another person's blood or that of an animal increases their power and provides life force directly to Satan. The circle. The circle is the Satanists protection from the forces they conjure up during their summoning and incantations. Coven. A group of non-traditional Satanists not normally exceeding 13 traditional Satanists do not have covenants. Cult. A group of people who follow a leader who, through his charismatic ways, command allegiance, belief, and worship. Infamous leaders include Hitler, Crowley, Jim Jones, and David Koresh. Devil. One such name of Satan, Lucifer, Leviathan, Prince of Darkness, Goat's Head, the symbolic identification of Satan in the world. Grottoes, countless Satanists in one order or organization. Hand of Glory, the left hand of a person who has died. The hand is removed from the body, pickled, embalmed, and mummified. It is then used to ward off evil spirits. The Head, Satanists believe that the head is the most important part of the body. They often eat the brain to receive powers of the deceased person. The heart. Satanists believe it to be the center of life. By eating the heart, they believe that assumption of the deceased's characteristics and powers will be thus transferred. Host. Normally using blessed communion wafers, symbolic of the body of Christ, Satanists insert them into the vagina of the altar, or physically stomp, thus desecrating Christian beliefs. Lucifer. When cast out of heaven, he was followed by one-third of all the angels. Pagans. Those who practice witchcraft, the worship of nature as well as multiple gods. Satan. 
an angel created by God, cast out of heaven, and now the object of worship by Satanists throughout the world. Succubus, a female demonic force that copulates with human males. Incubus, a male demonic force that copulates with human females. And witchcraft, the practice of the old religion which focuses on the goddess in her many forms. Perhaps one of the most despicable crimes in general, and in particular among Satanists, is that involving a child. In every state in the nation, there are reports and investigations of satanic crime and satanic ritual abuse. More than two million American children each year are reported missing, many of them too young to be runaways. In addition, more than 5,000 unidentifiable bodies of children are found annually in the United States. Physical abuse was a part of keeping me silent. My fingers were burned on a stove. I was um, forced to watch pets um, killed and put in an oven. And I was told that if I talked, the same thing would happen to me. They would dismember bodies and then hang me upside down over a vat. Um, I think it was acid, I'm not sure, but there were body parts. And they told me they would lower me into the acid if I ever talked about this. And one memory I had in order to get the blood, they used me as the person to get the blood from. I was basically the lamb, the child of God. And they would put pins and needles in between my fingers, and I would be bled so that they could have communion. Another way to keep me silent was to use a gun. Um, pornography, child prostitution, brings in big money and I was not to talk about that either, and I was threatened to be killed if I talked, as well as burned. They used cigarettes and other forms of burning um, to keep me silent, and I had a pet bird that they killed in front of me, and um, then I was put in a cage. And so as a young child, I made the association that if I were in a cage, then I must be like the bird. And if the, they can kill the bird, they can easily kill me too. Remembering comes out in poetry as well. And my pet bird was killed in front of me. And I was also forced to participate in the murder of babies. And so I wrote a poem about not being able to talk about that. Birds and babies go away, mustn't tell, mustn't say. Mommy will get mad at me, must pretend I do not see. Nothing happened, don't remember. Helter skelter, now dismember. Witches chant and babies burn, mustn't talk. It will be my turn. Symptoms characterizing satanic ritual abuse and sexual abuse in preschool-aged children. Low self-esteem, feeling of being bad, child feels deserving of punishment. Child is fearful, clingy, regresses to baby behavior. Separation anxiety. The child is angry and aggressive. The child acts wild, uncontrolled, hyperactive. 
the child is accident-prone or deliberately hurts himself. The child is negativistic, resistant to authority. The child mistrusts adults. The child is over-compliant with authority, over-pleasing with adults. The child has rapid mood changes. The child is withdrawn, does not play, or plays in a lethargic or unfocused way. The child exhibits a short attention span. The child does not learn. The child's speech is regressed and babyish. He has delayed speech or speech disorder. The child's speech production decreases significantly. There are somatic complaints, stomach aches, nausea and vomiting, nightmares and sleep disorders. The child is fearful of being touched, fears having genital area washed. The child touches his genitals or masturbates successively. The child touches or tries to insert fingers into his rectum. The child pulls down his pants, pulls up her dress, or takes off clothes inappropriately. The child touches others sexually or asks for sex. The child is sexually provocative or seductive. He or she complains of vaginal anal pain, burning when washed or when urinating or defecating. Semen or blood stains are found on the child's underwear. Detailed and age-inappropriate understanding of sexual behavior. Hints about sexual activity. The child complains that an adult or older child is bothering them. A reference to blood or white stuff in genital area. A statement that someone had removed the child's clothing. A statement that an older child or adult exposed themselves to the child. A child's statement that he or she touched an older child's or adult's bottom, vagina, rectum, mouth, etc. A statement that an older child or adult touched or penetrated the child's bottom, vagina, rectum, mouth, etc. A statement that the child witnessed sex acts. On medical examination, relaxed sphincter control, anal or rectal lacerations or scarring, the child relaxes rather than tenses rectum when touched. On medical examination, enlargement of vaginal opening, vaginal laceration or scarring in girls, sore penis in boys, blood or trauma in the genital area. On medical exam, venereal disease. Unfortunately, all of the signs of self-involvement, rebellion against authority, self-righteousness, disrespect towards parents, they're common in the growing up years. They're also signs of involvement in satanic cults. Perhaps one of the major signs of cult involvement is when the group moves into obsession. They get stuck on one idea, one type of clothing. They center focus on this idea and they do not deviate. They focus on destruction and on doom. They have many highs and many lows in their self-esteem. They have drastic changes in behavior like eating habits, cleanliness, punctuality, and attitude towards family and friends. Most of the people we deal with, the young adults that we deal with, uh, have other problems that um, are uh, synonymous with even sometimes gang activity. They're looking for um, uh, things that they may not have at home. Uh, they're looking for self-esteem. They're looking for um, something that they can belong to. And a lot of times these kids uh, start out uh, innocently enough trying to get into something that they feel that they're wanted. And uh, people will um, 
inform them and make their opinions to, uh, to the point where uh, they're really involved in satanic activity. Anytime you do have a situation where you find a ritual site or you, or you find graffiti that uh, shows uh, some kind of satanic uh, situation, then uh, you need to look at it and investigate it. And uh, I think the big thing is if you keep your mind open. Uh, parents uh, need to keep an open mind. A lot of times uh, parents uh, and uh, people in general will, will close their eyes to things that they don't want to hear. Uh, if, you, if you keep an open mind and uh, n try to know your kids and uh, learn what your kids are all about, um, I think that'll uh, be a big step into understanding what's going on and then being able to uh, identify any problems that may arise or, or situations that you might see that, that you might need to look for help and not keep a closed mind. Believe me, um, I've been in this business for 10 years and you're always um, amazed at what uh, kids will do and the different fads that come up. And sometimes it may be totally innocent. Uh, it may not be occult activity. It may not be satanic activity. But hopefully if you have the open mind, you'll be able to uh, notice that. Um, when we get involved in some of these training uh, uh, groups, uh, we try to talk to PTAs and school administrators and things like that, um, not only uh, just in uh, occult activity, uh, but just keeping an open mind on what teenagers are all about nowadays. And uh, they may be involved in this stuff. They may be what we call dabbling in, in some kind of occult activity. It may be just a rebellion on uh, uh, some form of Christian upbringing, uh, something to get your attention. As you observe kids that may be involved in satanic cult activities, be patient, be watchful. It's best to understand them because provoking them will only drive them deeper into the cult and that behavior. Teach the parents and the school officials and the youth workers to note these behavior changes and to take time to find out what's going on in their lives. Teach them to ask the meaningful questions and what the symbols are about that they might write on their notebooks and uh, they might wear on their clothing. Teach these youth workers and parents to talk to their kids about the lyrics of the songs that they listen to over and over again. They have a right to know what's going on in the young people's lives and, and open communication allows that to happen. Don't hesitate to encourage these parents and youth workers to seek outside help. Call your local support services for youth. They can be a great help to you. Never, never stop this important investigation into lives for the value of our kids in America. Satanists celebrate a host of rituals and ceremonies during the course of each year. As some are held more important than others, a host of crimes are committed before, during, and after the ceremonies. On January 7th, the celebration of St. Weinbald is held. It is a blood ritual and animal or human sacrifice, including surgical dismemberment, and they're completed with males between the ages of 15 and 33 years of age. Satanic revels are held on January 17th. A sexual type of ritual, anal, oral, and vaginal activities are found with female victims, ranging from 7 to 17 years of age. Candlemas, a high religious holiday, is held on February 2nd. At these sexual ceremonies, animal, oral, and vaginal rituals are completed with females from age 1 to 17. February 25th signals Beltane, a blood ceremony. Communions are held with blood filling the chalice. Animal dismemberment and sacrifices are common to this ceremony. The celebration of St. Icatat is held on March 1st. During the blood ceremony, human blood from devotees of any age and any sex is consumed for strength and as homage to demons. The spring equinox, March 20th, a celebration of orgies including anal, oral, vaginal or bestiality sex between devotees of any age and any sex. Sacrifices 
are common. April 21st to the 26th is the time of preparation for the grand climax. Kidnappings of women, children, and animals are common. Thus, the victims are held until April 26th to May 1st, a demure ceremony for corpus de ball. Age group includes infants and females up to 25 years of age. April 30th, called May Eve or Valpurgis Night, signals a host of activities and historically is devoted to coven initiations. June 2nd brings about anti-Christian ceremonies using blessed wafers and blood mixtures for many blasphemous purposes. June 21st and 22nd signal the summer solstice when orgies, anal, oral, and vaginal in nature take place. Any age, any sex. Demon revels are held on July 1st. Sex with demons, human and animals, primarily large dogs, take place with devotees of any age or any sex. July 20th to the 27th signals the time for additional kidnappings and holdings of victims for the July 26th Grand Climax and August Eve festivities, which include sacrifices. Satanic revels occur on August 3rd, with its sexual orgies with females from 7 to 17 years of age. The coveted marriage to Satan takes place on September 7th, at which time human sacrifices of groomed devotees occur. The age group is female, 1 to 17 years of age. September 20th is the time of the Midnight Host, a blood ceremony when dismemberment of females 1 to 21 years of age takes place. Hands are planted as part of the ceremony. September 22nd, or Michaelmas, entails anal, oral, and vaginal orgies that also include bestiality with any age or sex devotees. October 29th to the 31st, Samhain, or Halloween celebration, is a high unholy day. Sex with demons is primary, as is infant sacrifice. On November 1st to the 4th, satanic revels again occur. Anal, oral, and vaginal sexual activities take place with females from 7 to 17 years of age. And December 22nd, or the winter solstice, entails orgies with any age and any sex. And on December 24th, demon revels is a demure ceremony and a signaling of the high grand climax. Any age and any sex is included in these ceremonies. Richard Ramirez, known as the Night Stalker, was linked to Satanism. He had a pentagram on his left hand, and he would draw one on the walls of his victims' homes. At his arraignment, he yelled, Hail Satan! Richard Berkowitz, also known as the Son of Sam, that famous New York case. Henry Lee Lucas of Texas. Both of these men were linked to Satanism and ritualistic blood drinking.
Stanley Dean Baker of Massachusetts. At the time of his arrest, he had one of his victim's fingers in his pocket, and he was charged with dismemberment. He stabbed his victim 27 times, and he ate his heart. Ricky Casso of New York. He required his victim to say, I love you, Satan, as he stabbed him to death. Carl Drew from Massachusetts. His satanic cult killed a 20-year-old woman, decapitated her, they kicked her head around, and then later he had sex with her body. And in the history of the United States, only one case has been successfully prosecuted as a human sacrifice crime. That is the case of Clifford St. Joseph. Okay, the way we broke the St. Joseph case was some information received through some sharp patrol officer work. Uh, a couple of our patrol units that uh, operated uh, in what we call our Southern District responded to what was a drunken party. It appeared to be a drunken party. And uh, one of the fellows kept saying, they're going to sacrifice him, they're going to sacrifice him. Well, what he was talking about was they had gotten a second victim and intended to sacrifice him. What it, they had, had him captured for several days and had drugged him and, uh, and he was, had been drugged and a lot of, uh, had been uh, continual sexual activity, uh, male on male sexual activity with him as he was, he was chained nude into in the in the bedroom in the uh, bedroom and and then sometime he'd be chained to the fireplace in the living room and every guest would come he would be offered to part, you know to have sex with him and even at some point uh, they had a German shepherd have sex with him and it was beyond what would be seen in a normal encounter of uh, of, of gay male anal sex so we followed up on that and we were able to find that young man uh, after we talked to the fellow who was babbling earlier about this sacrifice. So we talked to that young man and he told a very bizarre story. The story was that this man had been captured. The first victim, John Doe 60, had been captured. He had been drugged and he had been sacrificed to Satan in honor of uh, St. Joseph, and uh, they, they, uh, that St. Joseph was the high priest, and that uh, he talked of other sacrifices, but we found no evidence of any bodies, any, anyone who had been uh, sacrificed in this area previously, at least the one that we've been able to recognize. So he then uh, told us that he had, how they had disposed of the uh, bloody mattress, and that they had done the initial uh, ceremony in a circle on the living room floor and of course we noticed that when we finally went to the uh, to that address with a search warrant we noticed there was all new carpeting all new mattresses in the bedroom so and what the officers noticed is there were so many things that were so bizarre that this person this, this citizen couldn't make up a lie this big couldn't get that drunk or get that loaded to make so we, the things started to fall into place. Everything started to make sense. And uh, I can tell you that our investigation of that case led us into the very highest echelons of our society, professional people, successful business people, who were associates and, and some, one of whom we know is a, uh, is a co unindicted co-conspirator to this day because we, the person, the young man who had been sexually abused, who was to be the second victim, uh, he, uh, we got him psychiatric treatment and got him strong enough to be able to testify. And he testified to all the things, the ritual that had gone on before his day of reckoning uh, to where he was to be sacrificed himself. And it is a very uh, precise procedure of what he eats, what he uh, what he is given to drink, and that he's kept in a sedated mood, uh, uh, condition 
for several days uh, prior to the, uh, the ritual. We uh, were able to prosecute uh, St. Joseph by using uh, evidence, physical evidence, because he was clever enough not to, he's clever enough not to test to give us a statement. Uh, at least the statement he gave us was innocuous. He, he was very clever in what he said and uh, how he said it. But one of the things we were able to, to do is corroborate the two young men uh, and with physical evidence. One, for example, we rolled that new rug back and the new carpeting, pulled it back, did a luminol uh, check on the premises, and there was blood everywhere. And when we, we did the luminol uh, uh, examination of the premises, we found the, the kind of blood that we expected to find. Because as I told you, the body was de almost devoid of blood. And uh, we knew that wherever this had taken place, there had to be a lot of blood. So in the cracks and crevices of the hardwood floor beneath the carpeting, even there were small blood spatterings on the walls, the lower part of the French doors, despite the fact of a thorough cleanup that had been ordered by St. Joseph after they disposed of the body. Uh, they deliberately picked and carefully picked uh, the John Doe 60 and the young man who was to be the second victim. And I, we were told that this is the habit. Uh, people, nobody's going to ever look for these people. Uh, they're the kinds of people, and there are lots of them around now, nowadays, where people don't, people drifters, people don't have any real ties, and they, uh, they were able to lure both their intended, their John Doe 60 and, their neck, and the other intended victim with the lure of drugs. Well, great many, a uh, uh, great deal of drugs, uh, and and they were very plentiful. And they that was one of the lures that they were able to to entice young men uh, to these areas uh, for the uh, to to look them over to see if they were suitable, possible suitable uh, characters to be uh, persons to be sacrificed. What was the um, sentence for Saint Joseph, and how is that all going? Uh, it's going, his appeal has been, St. Joseph's sentence was he was convicted of first degree murder and his, his sentence was life without possibility of parole and uh, it is going fine. His, his case has been upheld all the way up the line. So it, it was a successful prosecution, it's good solid evidence and uh, it all started, helped to saw, actually to solve that case with some uh, patrol officers being really sharp and following through on something that they saw that was unusual and not discounting a, a person as being just a, uh, a crazy drunk, hyped up kid, that they took the time to say, hey, wait a minute, it's too, too many thing, unusual things going on here. Let's, let's, if we don't know, let us call somebody who, who uh, will, may know. And then they, by doing that, they gave us the, the lead that we needed to break that case. Uh, on ritualistic, satanic, uh, cult kinds of crimes, you'll see a lot of un, uh, unexplained behavior. Try not to rationalize it off as being just, oh, just a bunch of kooks or just a bunch of druggies. Investigate, talk to people, identify people who are there. Uh, ask the, those persons who appear to be uh, really uh, loaded, book them as drunk, book them as under the influence, Call the detectives and ask. Look for unusual kinds of uh, uh, weapons, unusual kinds of uh, uh, cuts or, or wounds. And uh, for example, a single wound, none of the wounds when you looked at the body of, of John Doe 60, just as a layperson, none of these wounds would kill him. Even the carving of the pentagram into his chest, he'd bleed, but it would, he, this wouldn't kill him. And there was the fact that you have a dead body and, 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 there's, no, and you, you, there's no blood. There's some blood on the body, but there, there's no blood in and around the scene. Secondary scenes, because they, they've got to get rid of the body. They've got to get rid of it somehow. So we have to be very aware of anything unusual. Follow through on it. Call in help. Don't be embarrassed to say, hey, look, I don't quite know what's going on here. Call in uh, the detectives. And they, in turn, for investigators, call in experts who know how to deal 
who recognize some of these things. But one of the things you will see quite frequently, though, they do leave their mark. For example, the upside pentag down pentagram on John Doe 60's chest. Uh, we've had several other cases uh, where we're dealing with the ritualistic in the Golden Gate Park. Uh, this case was never solved, but this young woman was in the middle of a circle, and all around her were pentagrams painted on the trees uh, with her blood and painted on rocks. Uh, they uh, display the body in certain ways. If the body appears to have some ornamentation on it that, that doesn't fit, for example, maybe some beads or some kind of uh, uh, pin or pendant that doesn't fit the rest of their clothing. Uh, there is a case that can call several years ago uh, where the body was found, and this would be a different ritualistic group, for example. Uh, the body was in a circle. The head was decapitated. There were feathers sticking in the, the uh, exposed part of the neck, and all around the, the uh, body was uh, corn, uh, kernels of corn. And uh, we later learned that that this was a part of a, of a sanctifying of a cauldron by killing an, uh, an individual, by sacrificing an individual. Though, by the way, the head did turn up. We were told by experts that it would turn up. Now, this came out of a whole different part of, of, uh, of the society, but it's still a different kind of ritual where many times uh, there's a big controversy in some parts of the country now as to whether or not to allow the religious use of animals, and I think they, they, the Santerias did win that case, that they can use animals in their religion. Well, you'll see things like this. Don't be alarmed, just document it well. Document it very well, uh, know who's involved, and, be, and recognize it when you see it. And probably uh, the grave robbing is what most patrol officers are going to run. They're going to run into grave robbing, uh, stealing ornaments from churches, you start getting a rash of stealing, because they have to have, sometimes they want to get, even though they're satanics, they have to get something that's blessed. So they'll go, there'll be uh, church robberies. So if you start getting a series of, of church robberies, or any church robbery was, where the motive is not totally monetary gain, it's some kind, you know, relics are missing, like chalices and, and uh, different uh, religious ceremony uh, items. Look for that. Um, other things I can think of now is that they uh, also deal with certain animal uh, horns and parts and stuff like that, certain, such certain statuaries that you'll find on a premises. Uh, and I don't, uh, the bodies that appear to be part goat, part uh, human, uh, all in, in, a, in a man, part man in body. Uh, and you'll see uh, lots of candles. Uh, they use lots of candles of different colors and stuff like that. But there are a number of experts around uh, who study this phenomenon. And as I said, based on uh, my experience and studying, particularly with the St. Joseph case and a couple other cases that have had some dabblers around, uh, we capture that material, read it, learn about them. It's just like any other part of our society. It's here, and we as law enforcement officers will deal with it. We have to deal with it. And the best way to deal with any problem is to understand it. In investigating homicides, there are some very obvious ritualistic markings that will appear on a body that is the result of satanic killings. But some of the markings are a little more subtle. And so what we're going to do is give you an illustration of this on our model and also retrace some of the markings that were in the St. Joseph's case. You'll note on our model that there's oftentimes a cut that goes from behind the ear all the way down to the throat. You'll also notice that on the carotid, this right here would be cut where the blood would have been drained. And oftentimes there's wax laid on it to cover it up afterwards, after the body um, has uh, deceased. They will also put wax over the eyelids after they're deceased, and so those would be some of the head markings that would indicate a ritualistic killing.
Another area that's obvious in these kinds of ritualistic carvings would be the pentagram or the inverted pentagram on the right and the left side of the upper chest. This oftentimes is the signature of the high priest. Another area that you might find satanic ritual carving is in the stomach area. And as was true in the St. Joseph's case, the pentagram or the inverted pentagram was carved right here in his abdomen area. And you'll note again the points representing again the goat's head. Another area we'll want to note is the foot area. And right here behind the ankle bone, there is oftentimes an incision, just as our markings would indicate. And beyond that, on the bottom of the foot, they will sometimes cut the flesh and peel it back. And so you'll also note that. Another thing that is oftentimes done in ritualistic homicides is a penis is placed inside the mouth of the deceased person. Now as you look at the body of a person such as this, please note each and every one of these markings. You might just see one of the markings. It could be just the carotid or it might be just the marks behind the ankle or as obvious as the pentagram. But whatever it is, if you look just a little bit deeper, ask a few more questions and note to the investigators more information, it could lead to the solution of other crimes that have been just passively sitting on the desk without any clues. Maybe you think your community is immune to these satanic crimes. Well, it's not. The next victim might show up tomorrow on the beat. It could be in your community, or it could be in a major city, or a small rural area. Could be a member of your family. Could be someone you know. I challenge you to investigate each crime just a little bit deeper. Let's stop this heinous crime that's going on in the name of the devil. Let's stop it before it takes another victim. Let's stop the Richard Ramirez's and the Clifford St. Joseph's before they kill one more innocent person. <laughs>